Now, I spend a lot of time thinking and praying about where God's leading us as a church, asking him the question, where are you taking us, God? What kind of church do you want us to become? And in general terms, I think we already know that. He's made it clear that we're becoming a family of neighborhood churches where more people can experience his grace, grow in faith, and make an impact right where they are. And it's so exciting to see that that's happening across all of our ministries and our various locations. But every now and then, God gets specific with us. He gives us a clearer picture of what that is supposed to look like. And he shows us exactly what he wants for us in this next leg of our journey as a neighborhood church. We're excited to show it to you. Here it is, Cornerstone Community Church. It started as a conversation between two neighbors. Alan, on our staff, talking to his neighbor, Frank. Frank is the pastor of Cornerstone Community Church right here in this neighborhood. And Frank asked Alan if our church would consider merging with them or taking them over. Alan didn't know, and he said he'd find out. And we began to talk, we met for breakfast, and I've gotten to know Pastor Frank, and it seems very apparent that God is indeed in this opportunity. You know, I watch HGTV, and one of the shows on that channel I like is the show House Hunters. You've probably seen it. Families looking for a new home, and they give them all these options. And every time, what those families are looking for is always, they look at the inside of the house. Does the kitchen have new countertops? Are the bathrooms redone? Are the hardwood floors? All that kind of stuff. Or they look at the outside of the house. Is it beautiful? Is the landscaping nice? And that's all good. You should look at that. But nobody's ever asked the question, what are the neighbors like around this house? Who lives nearby? And you know, they should ask that question because who you live near should impact what your life is like. The people that live next to you, across the street from you, all around you, should make your life better. Nowhere is that more true than with the church. We should be, Christ followers, a gift to our neighborhoods, to our communities, to the people living around us. And our church as a whole should be a gift and a blessing to its city and neighborhoods around it. You know, maybe the solution to all the societal problems we keep talking about has been right under our noses all along. Maybe it's 2,000 years old. Maybe Jesus knew what he was talking about when he said the most important thing is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself. Maybe that's really what this is about. God's people loving him with all their heart and loving the people around them. That's what we believe is at the heart of the Neighborhood Church mission. And that's why we're exploring these opportunities. Eugene Peterson in his message translation says that John chapter 1 verse 14 that God moved into the neighborhood, our neighborhood. He came to us. And that's what we're supposed to do as a church, to come into the world, into the neighborhood, to make it a better place, to bless the people around us. Whether or not they ever come to the church itself, we come to them to help them experience God's grace, grow in their faith, and make an impact. And we want to ask you to do two things. Number one, continue to pray for ways that you can love your neighbors well. And number two, pray with us for this opportunity here in North Aurora, that God would unify us and clarify this vision as we move forward truly becoming a neighborhood church. You know, it occurs to me that uh, there's no service coming after this service, so I can preach as long as I want. <laughs> I won't do that to you. But you saw that video about a neighborhood church, and we talk a lot about that, being a chapel on our street and uh, what, making an impact in our neighborhood and our community. I'm going to show you a picture of the, our very first house uh, as the Frazier family, as a little couple. This is our house. Can you see Noah? He's a little about one, one year old right there in the front yard, toddling around. That's our first house, 474 Brook Drive in Crystal Lake little two-bedroom ranch, you know, we, we, I remember my wife found the house, uh, I didn't even know we were looking for a house, but she was, and she came uh, and told me we found a house, and we bought this house, and I have such sweet memories of uh, being in that place, raising our kids there, seeing them grow up there when they were very young, uh, and, you know, things change, we don't live there anymore, 
Uh, many of you have moved multiple times. I've talked to some people in our church that have moved over a dozen times for work. And so houses can have sentimental value, but you move. In, in our case, uh, we've moved once since then. We live in a house in Batavia now. And I remember the first time we drove by our old house after we had moved. And my wife almost started crying because they had taken down the window boxes that we worked so hard to put up in the flowers. And she thought, why would they do that? Those were so special. Uh, it's hard. Change is not easy. But that's the change I'm describing. That's expected, part of regular life, and it happens gradually over time. The change we're experiencing right now in our culture, in our world, is rapid. It's not over the years. It's not even over days. It's almost hour by hour, and it's, not, it's anything but normal or expected. It's unsettling, to be sure. Last week, I gathered together uh, in, in, out in Nevada um, with a group of pastors in a cohort that I've been meeting with for uh, the last three years. In fact, you heard from Pastor Jason Cusick a few uh, weeks ago in our sermon series uh, on this Songs of the Soul, where he preached about what he do with fear and anxiety from Psalm 42, the Psalm of Lament. And he's part of this cohort. We met together, got together to learn, to share, and it was while we were meeting Monday through Wednesday that things really began to happen and news began to break about the coronavirus. We spent a good deal of our time talking and praying together about how to lead our church as well in the midst of this. Uh, and you'll see a picture here of us together together when we were at Judd Wilhite's church at Central uh, Christian Church out in Reno, and uh, not Reno, excuse me, Henderson in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, none of us knew what was going to happen in the days to come. Like the rest of you, I've been watching the news, I've been listening to the so-called experts, I've been listening to the commentary and the opinions, and it's frankly difficult to know where to turn, who to listen to, who to trust. Uh, where, where do we turn in times like this? Well, I want to take a moment and remind us there's one place we can and should always turn, to God and to his word. Not just in times of crisis, but at all times, but especially now, we should turn there. You know, in the Psalms, often you read the Psalms, and there's little words in the margin called selah. That word means rest or pause. So I'd like us to take a little pause in the middle of this service together and have Becky Chenault read Psalm 103 to us and over us as we turn to God. Becky? Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower in the field. For the wind passes over it, and it's gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children. To those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Thank you, Becky. I just love hearing her voice read God's word to us. So she'll be coming to your home every week, no, virtually, to read God's word to you. It's good for us in times like this, at all times, but especially now, to turn to God and his word and remember what he says is true because it's easy to lose sight of that. We chose this psalm for this series, Song of the Soul, many, many months ago. We had no idea what would be happening in the world at this time, but it's, I think it's appropriate and it's perfect for us because God knew. God always knows. He's not surprised. He's not thrown off. He knew. And I want to encourage you, if you have not done so and you can, go back and listen to the previous 
uh, sermons and read the Psalms in this series, uh, particularly Psalm 46 and Psalm 91, the Song of Refuge, and also Pastor Jason's psalm, uh, sermon on Psalm 42. They were very appropriate and timely for this cultural moment. At the very center of Psalm 103, at the heart of it, is a, is a picture of a relationship. Verse 13 says, as a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. As a father, so the Lord. The center of the psalm is a picture of a relationship we have with God as our father. We throw that term around, and I don't know if we always pause and think, what does that mean to have God as my father? All the blessings, all the good things, the psalmist says not to forget. Forget not all his benefits and blessings. All the things that God is going to do, protection and provision and giving of grace and forgiveness, they all flow out of our relationship to God as our Father, to know him as our Father. This is central to what it means to be a Christian. In Galatians chapter 4, Paul says, God sent his Son in the fullness of time into the world to redeem the world. Why? To put his Spirit in our hearts so that we would have become children of God, the rights of children, no longer slaves, but sons and daughters, and heirs to know him as our father. The whole point of the Christian message is that God wants you to know him as your, as your father through Christ's love. That's why he came. This is how Jesus can tell us to pray our father. But sometimes we can say that, and it doesn't, it just, we don't think about it. I hope you never say, God, my father, the same way again. I hope every time you say that, it thrills you and it gives you pause, it takes your breath away and you stop and think, the God of the universe loves me like a father? And, and if you had maybe a not so good earthly father, if you've struggled to understand God's love because your earthly father was not all that he should have been, and none of us are, frankly, even your recognition that he was not all he should have been is your recognition that there's more, and God is that more. He is that father to you. Never, never let this get routine or dull to you. So what specifically does it mean from this psalm to have God as your father? I want to give you three relationships, three aspects of this relationship from this psalm. First, it's a relationship of grace. This is all over the psalm. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger in verse 8, he says. He forgives our iniquity in verse 3. Redeems your life, verse 4. Does not deal with you according to your sins, verse 10. Removes your transgressions, verse 12. In other words, you need grace. You are sinful. I am sinful. You're broken. You're insecure. You're fearful. You rebel. You wander away. You forget, like children do. But God is gracious. God is merciful. It's a relationship founded on, based on grace. God loves you permanently, unchangeably, despite, in spite of all your sin and failure. In fact, when you make decisions that rebel against God, when you ignore him, forget him, reject him, when you wander away from him, when you do destructive things intentionally or unintentionally that jam up your life, God's Father's heart is actually more engaged for you, not less. We tend to think that when we're, when we're doing right, then God loves us well and more. It's not so. In fact, every parent knows this. When your children are struggling, are you less compassionate or more? When your children are rebelling, moms and dads, do you feel more distant from them? No, you long to be closer to them. Your heart, as a parent, is more engaged. That's how it is with God. It's a relationship based on grace. I have not always gotten this right as a father. I have not always done this well. And I, I often pray that my failures as an earthly father would not prevent my kids from knowing their heavenly father's gracious love. And I pray the same prayer for you and for me. That's why in verse 17 it says, from everlasting to everlasting, his love endures. Everlasting to everlasting. Not to the moon and back, like I used to say to my kids, that's, that's temporary, that's measurable. But to infinity and beyond, as Bud Light, Buzz Lightyear says, right? To, from infinity to infinity, there is no end. You cannot be separated from him. So it's a relationship of grace. Second, it's a relationship of confidence. It's important here to note that the relationship of grace precedes this. The confidence we have in God as our Father comes from the fact that this relationship is based on grace. He holds it. It's not based on our performance. We don't have to earn his love. And this gives us confidence when bad things happen to us and when we do bad things. In verse 9 and 10, Becky read it. I'll read it again. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. 
he will not always chide, nor his anger last forever. But that's saying that God's father in love, there, he does get angry. He does sometimes chide and discipline us. But his anger is always for us. His discipline is always because he loves you. It doesn't mean that God ignores the broken parts of your life. He doesn't. Every parent knows this. There's a kind of anger, moms and dads, that comes from your desire. It's for your kid. You want good things, and when they they do things that, that are destructive to them or others, you get rightfully angry with that decision that they made. But it's because you want good things for them. You want the best for them. But every parent also knows there's a kind of anger that's really not about your kid. It's about you. You've embarrassed me. You've upset me. You've done something to shame the name Frazier or something like that, right? And so, and so what do we do? Then, then when we respond, it's about me. What the psalmist is saying is God never does that. He never repays. He never punishes. He never pays you back what you, what you deserve. He always deals with you as a perfect, loving father. And if it's discipline, if it's difficulty, if he brings things into your life that are hard for us to bear, it's for our good. It's because he loves us. It's to bring about his purposes in our lives. That gives you confidence. It means everything God allows into your life is ultimately for your good. That's a hard thing to say. It's a harder thing to believe. But it's true. You believe that? Do you believe that? That what God allows into your life, he can use for your good. You can rest in that. You can have confidence in that if you know him as your father. Sometimes God even uses pain to bring people closer to him. Lewis, C.S. Lewis writes about this uh, in his book, The Problem of Pain. He says, God whispers to us in our pleasures, but he shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. God's shouting to us sometimes in our difficulty and challenges. Now, don't be misled here. The Bible does not teach, and I'm not saying that God causes all the evil and terrible things that happen in the world. He does not. He does not cause people to sin. He does not cause calamity to come. But he can use it, and he can redeem it, and he's present with you in it as your father, if you know him that way. Third, and finally, a relationship of compassion. So we have a relationship based on grace. It's not performance, but grace. A relationship that's based, uh, that that produces confidence in us to know him as our father, that he's for us and we can't be separated from him. And a relationship of compassion. Look at verse 13. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. That word compassion in Hebrew uh, and the word that's translated later in Greek, it, it, it means a deep emotional feeling, a tenderness. Every mom and dad knows this feeling. When my kids were little, I want, you want to snuggle them and cuddle them all the time. You want to squeeze them. When they're 13 and 14 and 15, they don't want you to squeeze them anymore. They don't want you to cuddle them and grab them. But do you stop wanting to? Mom and dad, no, you never stop wanting to. They push you away, they give you the stiff arm, but your heart doesn't change. It's just weird if you grab your 15-year-old, mm, you can't do that anymore, right? But God's heart never changes. He always longs to show us tenderness and compassion. He never grows out of that. Sometimes we, sadly, do, but he doesn't. God longs to draw you into a relationship with him of grace, of confidence, where you would know how much he loves you. The whole point of this psalm is that we don't deserve to be loved this way. God does not treat us the way we deserve. He treats us according to who he is, his character and nature. Tenderness, grace, mercy, compassion. This is how the psalmist can say at the beginning and the end, bless the Lord, O my soul. This is a declaration and an invitation. Bless the Lord, O my soul. How, How can we do that? Because I know the grace, I have the confidence, and I feel the compassion of God's love. Now, there's a lot we're being told that we can't do right now in our culture. Can't travel certain places. There's restrictions on that. Some of us can't go to work. We can't gather in large groups. You can't go to school, although maybe, maybe celebrating that. You can't go to lots of different places. We can't watch March Madness, for crying out loud. But here's something we can always do. We're doing it now. You can do it every moment of your life. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless the Lord. Forget not his benefits. Remind yourself and those around you of this relationship of grace that gives confidence and compassion. I want to give you three choices, three other things you can do, three choices we can make out of this relationship in our current moment in this culture. As a church, three critical choices we can make right now. 
First, we can choose faith over fear. We can choose faith over fear. The Bible says that faith is not a feeling. It's, 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 it's a gift of God's grace to us, and those who have been given this gift, we must choose to walk in it. That God has given us faith, we choose to walk in it. We walk by faith, not by sight, the New Testament tells us. You know, fear is also a kind of virus, isn't it? And it spreads even more rapidly than the flu or the coronavirus. It's contagious. But so is faith. We can choose faith over fear. God does not want his children to be living in fear, but to be walking in faith. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Paul, writing to Timothy, says, God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. It's an amazing little statement here. God's given you a spirit, but it's not a spirit of fearfulness. It's a spirit of power and love and self-control. This, this passage written by Paul, by the way, he wrote this while he's in prison to Timothy, his younger brother in the faith. He's saying, you can make a choice here. You have the power and the self-control by God's grace to choose faith. So tomorrow morning when you get up and the world is a little different than it has been the previous weeks and months, let me just give you a challenge. Before you go to your newsfeed, before you start scrolling, before you flip on whatever channel you get your news from, go to the Word of God. Quiet your heart. Choose faith over fear. Because we're, we're being bombarded with messages that are stirring up fearfulness. Choose faith first. Start your day tomorrow and every day this week by turning your heart to Him. Second, we can choose prayer over panic. I was at a local grocery store this week trying to buy some supplies, and I don't, I, I don't know why everyone is buying all of the toilet paper. I, it's, the, the government has not issued a decree. Listen, people, you're going to be doing a lot of wiping, so buy toilet paper. Get lots of it. You need, everyone, run out and get it. But it, it's gone. It's all gone. And I did a little research online. Social psychologists actually call this panic purchasing. It happens in times of crises. One person will start buying something. People see a lack of it. They get nervous and worried. They buy it. Somebody else sees it. They buy it. And pretty soon the shelves are down. And the whole culture thinks, oh, this is the thing I must have. What it's really coming from is a deep desire in us to find some place of control when our lives feel out of control. And so we fixate on something like toilet paper. Have to have it. Have to have it. Almost irrational behavior. God invites us not to fixate our fearfulness and panic on something like that, but to pray. To pray to him. To gather together and pray. Also, Paul's letter to Timothy, his first letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high possession, positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. First, he says, first of all, gather together and pray. Pray for people in positions of leadership all around this country and world. You know, you, another thing we do, in addition to buying toilet paper, is we want to fixate blame, don't we? I see it all the time. Someone's to blame for this. And both sides of the political aisle are doing it. People are looking for a reason and someone who's at fault. The Apostle Paul to Timothy and God to us is saying, no panic purchasing, no panic blaming, pray. Pray to the God who sees and who knows. Pray for those in positions of power. Pray for those on your street. Pray for those who are vulnerable. And as you pray, it realigns your heart with the one who's in control. God's, as God's children, our highest priority is that people would look to us in times of crisis and see in us not perfection, but the power of God, the peace of God, the grace of God. Paul says it, right? He desires all people to come to know him. How will they do that if we're panicking? Third, the third choice we can make. Choose service over selfishness. It's so tempting for us to sort of turn inward in times of crisis, to, to look inside or to worry about our own and just take, hunker down and just take care of our own. In fact, we're being told, stay inside, don't go out, you know, uh, unless you have to. And we can 
make the mistake of thinking that just look out for you and yours. Historically speaking, it's in times of crises and difficulty that the church has flourished. And it's flourished because the church has always been about service. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says the church is the one institution that exists for the benefit of its non-members. That we, God's put us here for the good of those who are not already part of the body of Christ. That's why he's put us here. And nowhere is that more important than a time of crisis. I don't know two months from now, one month from now, a year from now, how we'll look back on this moment and what, how we'll evaluate the current cultural situation. Are people overreacting? Was it, were we underreacting? I, don't, I have no idea. I can't predict the future. But I, I hope we all, as Christ followers, will look back on what we did as, as followers of Jesus in this moment. And we'll look back and see what God did through our service. Because we chose faith over fear and prayer over panic and service over self. This has historically been what the church has done. Our own church is over 125 years old. There are members of our congregation who've lived through world wars, who have seen the Great Depression, who've lived through diseases. And this is not new to us as a church, nor to God's church in the world. First Timothy, uh, excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Do not be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. I like Paul's advice here. Keep your head. Be clear-minded. Don't lose your head. Let's do our research on what's going on in the world. There'll be some challenges, but let's follow Jesus. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord, he says. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. Listen to that. Fully carry out the ministry God has given to you. Well, what's the ministry he's given to you? What is it? Maybe you don't think you have a ministry. Friends, you do. You do. To the people seated next to you right now at home, to the people that live on your street that you're going to go to work with, you have a ministry to them. Your very presence, your very life is to be a ministry to them. In this moment, let's fully carry out the opportunity, the ministry God has given to us. You know, uh, in, in the, the last pagan Roman emperor was Emperor Julian. Julian the Apostate, he was named. How'd you like that to be your name for all, of, for all <laughs> down through, the, through history? Uh, he wrote to the pagan priests about his frustration with what he called the Galileans. Those were the early Christians. There was a plague uh, ram- ravaging Rome, and the wealthy Roman citizens uh, were leaving the city, so they didn't, want, they didn't want to be infected. So they were getting out of town, literally, to save themselves and their family. The poor couldn't afford to do that and, and were being de- horribly impacted. One unique group stayed in the city. Julian called them the Galileans. They were the Christians. The Jesus people, they stayed. Why? To, to provide care, to provide service, food, healing, hope, and help. He writes about this. He says, when it came about that the poor were neglected and overlooked by the pagan priests, I think the impious Galileans, Christians, observed this fact and devoted themselves to philanthropy. They support not only their own poor, but ours as well. And all men see that our people lack aid from us. <laughs> He's mad. What's wrong with these Christians? They're caring for not only their own poor, but for ours as well. And it looks bad for us. I'm not saying we should be trying to make people look bad. But we should be known as the ones who care, the ones who serve, the ones who stay in the midst of crisis. God is so gracious to us. And I I look forward to the day when we could look back and say, look what God did. We saw it as an inconvenience. We saw it as a time of fear. But really, God was doing something. And the church rose up in a way that it hadn't before. That's my prayer for us, Chapel Street Church, and for all the churches. I've been in contact and communication with a number of pastors around our own community. We're praying the same thing, that God would use this as an opportunity for the gospel, that more people who are looking around in panic would look to him, would turn to him. Well, how will they do that unless we're the church? And what an opportunity, and what a great God who loves us as a father and is protecting us and loving us even now. Let's pray together. Father, we don't know what the days, weeks, months, and years ahead hold, but you do. You know all things. You hold all things together by a word of your power. You are right now sovereign over all things. You are right now working all things together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. We don't always see it. Sometimes we doubt it, but it is true nonetheless. So help us by your spirit to choose to walk in faith, not fear 
to choose to focus on prayer and not panic, to choose service over self, and in doing that, to make you known, to make you, Jesus, famous in our community, in our neighborhood, in our state, our country, and in this world. People are looking for answers, and we love and serve the one who has them all. Thank you, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen.